world when he came into it. If it was that dark then, how dark is it now? There, it's still, uh, the, the darkness doesn't comprehend the light. Uh, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. So here it is, John the Apostle is now speak, going to speak about John the Baptist, right? As the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not the light. John's witness of himself was that he wasn't the light, right? But he was sent to bear witness of that light that was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Some of these things can be, can be seen in type in the Old Covenant. You know, the Word is the light unto our feet and so forth. There's Psalms and Proverbs and other scriptures that have been written that gives us this kind of context. But look how John puts it together. And, of course, he puts much of this together as, as a rebuttal to many of those agnostic or the different types of beliefs that were there and present in that historical setting. He, this, this is a rebuttal. Uh, it's a rebuttal to the religious Jew's mind. It's a rebuttal to many of those uh, false beliefs in, uh, in the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not, verse 10. That's still the case. Verse 11, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. He came unto the Jewish nation, and they rejected him. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Which, of course, John here is one of those. Which, and we are as well. Which were, were born not after blood, nor the will of the flesh. Isn't that interesting? I mean, that's revelatory, even though the old covenant says that a virgin, behold, a virgin will, will bear a child. Still, this, is, this really hits it right on the head when he says, John says, by the Spirit, which were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's what I was pointing to. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. So, so we see here uh, kind of a progression in, in the revelation and in, in observance by John. He saw, saw them as the manifest Son of God. He saw them, Him as the Word taking on flesh. He saw Him as being with God before the creation. And all things were created by Him and through Him. And now he, he moves a step forward. He says, he came and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. What's John referring to there? In my mind, he's referring to the transfiguration. Remember, he was up on, on that mount with Peter. So, so I believe that he is referencing this, this type of the resurrection glory that Christ was going to come in after his death. So they beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, the only begotten, you know, as opposed to being created. He wasn't created. He was begotten, full of grace and truth, full of grace and truth. That's contrasting something, isn't it? I mean, there's something that he's contrasting that full of grace and truth against. John, bear witness of him. And you might say, what? Well, I'm going to tell you in just a second because it's in a few verses. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. So this is John the Baptist had been. He had the same revelation. God had given him that revelation in his wilderness experience. When he was out in there eating locusts and honey, uh, he, he, he had, this, had this visitation, this revelation, this word from God that said, you will baptize with water, but one will come after you, which when you see the, the Spirit land on and remain there, then you uh, will know this is the Son of God who comes to baptize in fire, in the Spirit of God. So here John is bearing witness that... that uh, he, he's preferred over me because he was before me, and he's greater than I am, in other words. 
this is this is a rebuttal to those that were then did you do you know the Lord? Do you know the Spirit? No, what do you know? I know the I know John the Baptist. I know the baptism of water. I know the baptism of justification and repentance. See, he's saying, but I'm not that's not where we're supposed to be. That that was just the beginning. Hey, there's someone that's coming as better than me, that's going to do more and beyond me, and I'm just preparing his way. Once he's here, then there's no need for me, the bridegroom's uh, friend. Uh, he, so, so John is testifying about how he's preeminent and beyond him in meaning and significance. In verse 16, and his fullness have all we received and grace for grace. Grace for grace. Grace on top grace. Grace and more grace. For the law was given by Moses. And here's what that contrast I was saying above. He's full of grace and mercy, grace and truth. Verse 14, what was he contrasting it? He contrasted it with the law. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And then a, that's a huge statement there, especially in the ear of religious Jewish people. Verse 18, no man has seen God at any time. It's, it's interesting. That's, that in itself, just to digress just a moment, that in itself, that one verse was written, this, this book was written, this gospel of John was written sometime 70, 80, 90 years A.D. Christ had passed away 50, 60, 70 years ago. 50, 60 years ago. And here he makes this statement. John makes this statement. No man hath seen God at any time. Okay, well, it, has, it refutes that all were raised from the dead and were brought and set before the Lord. It, it just did, hadn't happened, didn't happen, hasn't happened. And this just this one verse it, it, it jumps out at me as saying that. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who has seen Him and came from Him, who now sets with Him, is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Well, who are you then? Art thou Elias? And he said, I am not. Art thou, art thou that prophet? You know, that prophet that Moses had predicted that one would come uh, in his stead someday. And he answered, No. Then they said unto him, Who art thou? That we may give an answer to them and send us, What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. This is the scripture you can cross reference into Isaiah 40. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptize they if, thou, if you aren't this, that? And John answered them, saying, And they believed the scripture. I'm sorry. And, and he answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom you know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes lash it I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Beth Abarah, Beth Abarah, Arah, Beth Abarah, beyond Jordan. My understanding is they don't know where that is anyway. And not only can I not say it, I couldn't find it then either where John was baptizing. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. I want you to note that, that statement because it's, it's a part of this lesson that I'm bringing forth. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming. Well, this must have been a, a few days after he bad baptized Jesus for it was only then that he knew Jesus. Before that, he didn't know Jesus. He didn't know he was the Lamb of God. He didn't know anything about him. But when he saw the Spirit in the form of dove come and land on him and remain there, then he knew this is the one. This is the Son of God. And so now he makes this statement in their ears. Here comes Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God, which fadeth away or taketh away the sin of the world. And then on and on. You, you know, you all know this, these, these verses. Well, I'll finish just a few more verses. And I knew him not, 
and, and, and this is verse 30. This is he of whom I said, after me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not. So John, John was born of, of Mary's cousin, right? But but he, he, they didn't know each other. They had been separated. They were living in different places. They're, they, they had no dialogue. They had, they had no uh, communication. I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore, am I come baptizing with water? And John bore record saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said to me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So meditating down those lines, not having any predetermined idea, where I was going, I just was meditating on, on this amazing, these amazing statements here in uh, Scripture as it relates to Jesus Christ. I, I am exalting Christ in my heart. I am, I am asking Him to expand my mind and, and give me that sound mind that He's promised those that would seek Him so that I could see him more clearly and understand more clearly and appreciate him more. So uh, I was just meditating these scriptures. And it, the Gospel of John starts off with this uh, amazing disclosure of who the Son of God was. And, he, you know, internal past and manifest in the form of flesh. And then who he, he will be in, the, in those words that you can find it in that he saw his glory, that, that, that speaks in, in, in view of his resurrection glory. So it's amazing how he, John, describes Christ and, and how he was manifest as Jesus Christ on the earth and, then, and is now full of resurrected glory as the only begotten sitting at the right hand of the Father. And what is critical here to, to my understanding as a Christian is comprehending the great transition. There's this transition, Christ, Jesus, the Son of God, the begotten of God, in the beginning was with God. There was nothing created without him. The transition from there to flesh and then from there to glory is, is a, a critical part of our understanding of Christ and the salvation plan of God. And I think we think we know it pretty much. By, by about 10 or 12 or 13 or 14 years old, you've heard enough, blah, blah, that you fairly well feel like you know. You know, I'm familiar with it. Yeah, I know. He was, he is, he will come, blah, blah. But what the depth of that uh, is, is seen that we don't know because our actions belie what it is that we think we know. And many of the words of people, Christians, uh, belie a clear understanding of how it is that Jesus Christ was manifest in the flesh, this transition. Uh, we need that. We need a clear revealed perspective of that. After having seen and declared brilliantly the supernatural origin of the manifestation in flesh, John's contrast of Jesus with Moses is enlightening. So there I go. You know, I was not intent upon meditating down this line, but this is the scripture that jumps out at me as I'm fellowshipping with the Lord. It's, uh, it's very interesting and enlightening to consider the word where it says in John here, for the law was given by Moses. For the old covenant law was given by Moses. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. 
I already know that the Lord was trying or is trying and has been trying to reveal to me in the fullness the difference. Some don't care. Some think they already know. Some present them, themselves as if they know. They talk as if they know. They teach as if they know. But what they teach is contrary to the Word of God, so they don't know. Jesus did not come to give the law of Moses a boost of familiarity. You know, I think that's in some people's minds, a lot of Christians, was that Jesus did come to give the law of Moses a boost of familiarity, familiarity in order to further its influence or to help Moses advance the laws and precepts that are found in his book. You have a great talent in jumping to the end of what my <laughs> message is. Yeah. Uh, but that's right. I mean, he, he, he has come before us to, let, to show a, a, a pattern and, and an attainable pattern in him. How did Christ attain? In the spirit. He was 30 years old, and he was minding his business at the carpenter store. He had submitted himself to his mother and his father, and he was in business, and he was working. When it was heard all over the land, come see John the Baptist, the prophet of God, certainly bringing forth the word, a water of baptism word. Here now, Jesus hears the call. He hadn't before, he hadn't walked in this call that he had been called for, but he was found faithful in everything up to that point that God had called him to do. He studied to show himself approved and he grew in faith and grace and strength in the eyes of God and in man. You're going to interrupt me again. Go ahead. Because I won't be able to speak with your arm in there. And now I know why that for the Jews that the law, that him saying the things he said were so offensive to them because they wanted to do everything through the law. They didn't want to do it through him. Again, you're all stomping all over my thunder. Again. Stop it, Kathy. Just I know you hear from the Lord, just hold it. <laughs> so it is in the call of the, the water baptism in the ministry of John, right? I mean, he came to prepare the way, right? So it's in his, in the hearing of the calling of John that Jesus, the Messiah, comes in and pre pre presents himself. Before that, no one knew him as the Son of God or the Messiah or the the suffering offering for Israel, no one had a clue. And Jesus was living his life in the flesh. Son of God, son of man. And here the call went out. Here the, the words came to his ears. And in his heart, he knew that was his call. He was waiting the call to go to John. To what? To fulfill all righteousness. To fulfill all righteousness, he went to be baptized. Not because he was in need, because he was a sinner. <laughs> so here he goes. And he's, that's this point that the Lord has made here in John, the Spirit has made, is that this Spirit came and landed on him. And what's interesting is, and I don't have the answer, and I don't know why I bring it up, because it just might cause you to go off in your mind somewhere where I don't want you, but you'll note that the word says that the Spirit came and abode on him. You know, it doesn't say that it came in him and filled him. It said it came and abode on him. I think that's significant because that is the whole old covenant. It was that the Spirit abode on them. It didn't abide in them. And the word in John 14 later says it is you, it's, the Spirit is with you, but He will be in you. And I think it's significant to see that there was this outpouring, uh, singular outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the Lord Yeshua. And that this is a part of this transition that we as Christians are to 
to have an understanding of. I'm answering Kathy's question. She's on to something else. So back to my lesson, okay? I'll touch on that a, a little, in a little more depth in the lesson. So I was saying, for the old covenant law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Jesus did not come to give the law of Moses a boost of familiarity in order to further its influence or to help Moses advance the law's precepts, but came in answer to the law. He came in answer to the law. Do you understand what that means? You, sh you should at least have a, a kind of a cursory understanding. He came in answer to the law. The law, the law pronounced this. And he came to address this because it wasn't addressed in itself in the law. So he was the answer, or answered to. He, answered, he fulfilled. He filled with meaning the law. This is to fill with meaning and manifest what the law did not. What is that? The Father in his fullness. The law of Moses, Moses who was the giver of the law, could not reveal Christ's Father or Christ in, its, in his fullness in the Torah or in the law. What is his fullness? How did he how does, he, how does he fill it with meaning? And what is, what is the answer to the, uh, the Mosaic Law? The answer is grace and truth. That's why John wrote here that in Moses came uh, grace. Uh, in Moses came the law, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And it was to reveal the Father in the fullness of his nature. After having seen and declared this, the law of Moses was to be, was to the chosen people and God, the vehicle by which was intended to manifest and advance mainly those certain attributes of the sovereign God, his holiness and justice. Can you see it? The law of Moses, Moses was given the law that God might manifest, or he might move forward in advance in their thinking, his attribute or attributes of holiness and justice. But that not being the fullness of God, which was also testified by Moses who gave the law, and you'll remember, and he hid himself between the rocks, and Christ... The father hid him between the rocks, and then in Exodus 34, 6, and 7, he, he, he proclaims God in more than just holiness and justice, but in loving kindness and forgiving and etc. So it, it wasn't something that the law understood or portrayed, but it was something that the lawgiver, Moses, had understood. The laws... The laws, the law could not adequately portray these other attributes of God. They weren't intended to. The law's purpose being that man, although now acutely aware of God's required holiness seen within the law, is yet slow and stubborn to recognize his inability to have an acceptable goodness outside of his own proud abilities within himself. Thus the law must, or was, in other words, presently and past tense, was given for what? To bring weight or burden upon the conscience and reveal his own inabilities to be holy and humble him to see his great need. So here we have 
the intent of the law. The intent of the law is to manifest and promote the attributes of God, his holiness and justice, so that those that received and heard that covenant and, and took it upon themselves to perform had aligned themselves to, to keep God's justice and holiness. God, knowing that they could not live to righteousness within the confounds or confines of his justice and holiness. They couldn't. And he knew that. And he gave a blood offering that would atone for their lacking, for their not being able to live up to his holiness and justice. But the idea is to, was to promote God's holiness and justice while revealing to man that he in himself has not the ability to live to the standard of goodness in himself. That, that's, that's the word, par, paraphrased, but that's, that's the word of God. And note that, that how he did that was he placed a burden or a weight upon the conscience. And a lot of that had, was accomplished in the laying on the hands onto that innocent sacrifice and confessing his, his, his sin. And, and that was to bring to mind, I, I have failed here in living up to God's holiness and his justice has got to be answered. It's got to be answered. So here it is right here in front of me. Here's how I answer his justice by recognizing that an innocent blood of an animal has to be shed so that I'm atoned for not living up to his holiness and justice. And, but that couldn't, been, that couldn't be accomplished in rote ritual. It's, it, had, it had to have accompanying it a humble heart in order for it to be effective. So the idea of the law was to bring a man to the end of himself and see there's no way we can live to the standard of God's holiness and justice though he requires it of us. How are we going to ever be able to accomplish that? That's, that's seen if you have that eye already to see, it's seen in the transition. That's the only way. By the Spirit, in the manner of Christ, in Christ, the transition. It's seen in the transition. How in the world are we going to live up to the standard of God's holiness and justice? We're going to run out of cattle. <laughs> We're going to run out of sheep. How, would they run out of cattle and sheep in about a month? Well, they would have if they would have literally all of them want to attain, uh, unto, which is the word, sacrifice, offering, draw nigh unto God. If they all, all the Israelites in the wilderness would wanting to draw nigh unto God, and to do that they had to confess their sins and kill an innocent animal, there wouldn't have been any cattle left in about a month. Am I right? So it... He, here what I'm teaching you is not for all of Christendom because all of Christendom is not going to hear this. But there were those that did hear those, those that mixed with this faith. Faith. Faith in Yahweh. Faith in God. I don't know how. I just know he will. I, I have a humble heart. I am woefully below the standard he sets for me and I am so grateful for this, this animal that I can yet try to draw nigh unto him through this blood. This is seeing the transition. This is God's intent, his purpose. We looking back can see it clearer 
than they could see it as they were faced with the obligation to honor God and obey him because they entered into covenant with him. They didn't have any alternative. They had to do this. Thus, scripturally understood, the law given by Moses brought or brings the ministry of the law, condemnation and death. Is that not what the new covenant tells us? But its intent was to point to a Messiah. Its intent was to point to Jesus Christ. All of this I'm pulling out of that one verse. <laughs> John 1, 17. Therefore Moses was not a minister of life, but of death. Isn't that what we find in Romans 7, 6 through 11? We find this description of how Paul describes that the law, uh, the, a law actually uh, uh, brought about a greater uh, accountability and a greater sin. Because the, when you didn't know it was a sin, then it, you weren't as accountable unto it as you were when you knew it was a sin. So the law that was, was they would have thought or perceived to be something to obey to bring life actually brought death. Yes. I guess you like me just stuttering and stammering up here, not finding the clear path unto the Lord. You enjoy watching me. And what I'm seeing, because they so would be under the law, the law could bring them eternal life, but it could never bring them sonship. It could never, never produce the pro the bride that the Messiah needs in order to rule the mind True. I don't think there is much argument with that in any Christian circle, not, not blatantly and openly. It's sub, subtle and subliminal. And so we're dealing with, with shadowy kinds of theology and understandings. They're not distinct because there, there's so much pushback in any Christian from saying that salvation is found in the law of Moses. You're just not going to hear that because there's too much scripture to the contrary. But it's mixed in there it's a mixed theology, and that's really where I'm going with this. I was saying, therefore, Moses was not a minister of life, but to death. Romans 7, 6 and 11. The law made, makes demands of justice on man, which he sees he cannot comply with. That's the idea that he would see that he cannot comply with. Thus, the law of Moses came first before grace and truth, the answer to the law. Can you see that? The law had to come first. before when We had to come to, to that place where we saw in us no ability to walk in the goodness of our own abilities to, to, to satisfy the holiness and justice of God. Now, if God didn't have any holy and holiness and justice, we might have been able to make it just based on his love and mercy. We'd make something. I don't know what that would have been, but it wouldn't be the same because that God wouldn't have been the same God. This God has all attributes of which he is revealing progressively over a period of time from the creation of Adam up to this day on Mount Sinai He's revealing himself in different manners and ways. And, and to see the transition we spoke about at first in us, we have to see the transition of the Lord. We have to see what it is that, that he represented then, then, and now. Oh, 
Old Covenant law given by Moses convicts men of sin in view of God's holiness and justice and points toward the need, towards the need for a Redeemer Messiah. I would suppose that, that there were those that, that laid hands on the innocent animal and transferred their guilt or their sin over onto that animal in atonement that must have mixed that with some thinking of there's, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a greater way. There's gotta, God must have a different way. That surely this grieves God. Surely, you know, me and this priest having to slay this innocent animal doesn't give God any pleasure. You know, if you have intuitively, you should have this instinct that, that this is not fair. This is not right. And so intuitively, you... I would suppose that there were those that had came to a revelation of a greater means by which they, they might draw nigh unto God. Those that were genuine, genuinely there to give Corban unto the Lord. The New Covenant law reveals sin more darker. Whoop, wait a minute. Catch that. I said the New Covenant law. I didn't say new covenant. I said new covenant. New covenant law. Is there such a thing? The new covenant law reveals sin more darker with greater burden. If the old covenant brought to the conscience a burden to bear that needed now, since it's a burden to bear on your heart, needs to be dealt with, it requires justice. If the covenant and the law of Moses brought this burden on the heart, how much more would a new covenant law transgressed would bring a burden upon a new covenant believer's heart? Thus, you begin to see the transition of God's plan. It also... The law, the new covenant law, reveals sin more darker with greater burden, but greater purpose. With, with the greater, darker revelation and the greater burden comes greater purpose. Can you hear me? Can you hear me saying transition, transition, transition? We're moving. We're moving forward here. You think the law of Moses was tough? You think the law of Moses is the answer? We're, you're not in the transition. You're not moving forward in God's plan. You, you, you know, you, 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 you stopped as an eight-year-old. Or I like to think of it like this, and I, it's not a very good one, but it's the best one I can think of. Uh, you're infatuated fascinated with that tadpole. <laughs> you have, wow, look at that thing. Ooh, man. You have no knowledge that that's a frog in the making. But look at that tadpole. <clears throat> Has a greater purpose and a greater means to attain unto all, all, all of the attributes of the Father. Now we're transitioning because in the Old Covenant it was about holiness and justice. Now we're transitioning. We're getting a, a greater responsibility, greater accountability, become greater efficacy. Now we're, we're also seeing that it opens up, the, the, the New Covenant opens up the additional attributes of God and makes us able to... In, to involve ourselves in, the, in his other attributes. Besides just experiencing his holiness and his justice, now we're moving into this thing, this transition into something that is going to allow us to participate in the fullness of his attributes. But with the fullness of his attributes comes this greater 
accountability, responsibility, atonement, and put all the emphasis where you may, it is all the things that you can think of. That, but that, how are we going to attain unto all these attributes of the Father? That's by the grace and the truth that's in the Son. Moses was a giver of the law. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. It's a contrast between only God's holiness and justice with all the rest of His attributes. That's the contrast that you're going to find there in John 1, 17. Hey, this is not for the babies. Word manifest as flesh. <laughs> what do you do that for? Well, it must have something to do with the new covenant. It must have something to do with contrasting the old covenant with the new because he, John made the point of saying it, this came by him, but this came by him. And here in this new covenant experience, in understanding the law of the new covenant, Christ, who owned the law of Moses, he owned it. He owned it when he said, it is written, but I say. It was written, but I say. He owned it. It was his, but now I'm taking it on another way. I'm taking it. It's moving with me. I, I am the Word. I am the Torah. I am. And I'm moving it right here. You heard, but now you hear. It is that place. Eliza was there. Moses is there. Jesus was there. Hear you, my son. Hear you, him. This is my son. Hear you, him. This is a transition. This mercy and this grace and truth that John is speaking about here has to do with the revelation through Jesus Christ of the remaining attributes of God. Not just a revelation like Moses had who was between the cleft of the rock and God passed by and spoke about all of his attributes. Not in that type of relationship, but out. With that, not behind any rock, but standing on a mountaintop and shouting it along with him. No longer has no man seen God. No longer has... No man been in the presence of God. We're moving to that presence of God. What did, what did God say to Moses? No man can see me and live. <laughs> what, what can? The new creation can. And not just the new creation. It's a new creation created in the image and likeness of God. His Son. And in this new covenant law, as we read it, we peruse through it, we examine where God said to hear ye him, what does that mean? That means look and re read and meditate and allow his words to dictate to us our life and our behavior by the Spirit, the same Spirit that did so in him as the Son of Man. And when we do, we will come to that same conclusion that the writer of Romans, Paul, came to in that sin is exceedingly sinful. That's how I discovered sin being so exceedingly sinful is when I see the laws, both old and new, that, are, that I agree with 100%, but I have not in me an ability to fulfill what I know is right. Now, you got to, that now in that revelation, you're embracing all the attributes of God. His love, His mercy, the, the blood, the greater blood sacrifice. That's, that's what you, when you see, you, you, when you say, oh God, woe is me. Woe is me. How, how can any man... How can any man escape a condemnation? Uh, condemnation? 
Well, it, it's only in Christ. It's only in seeing all of God. It can't be done over here. We've transitioned from that. It won't accomplish what, we're, what God had intended from the beginning. It leaves you short. It leaves you like a tadpole. You just swim around as a tadpole. You never transition. And you want to have the glory of a frog. So in this we see, finally we will come. Finally. I, have, I see it at least dimly. I see how exceedingly sinful sin is. And I see how clever it is. And how subtle it is. And how... It hides in plain sight. And how everybody's participating in it, but it's okay. Because it's not perceived to be exceedingly sinful. It's okay. It's okay. I'm playing poker. I'm playing poker. Right, Scott? I'm playing poker. It's, it's, the best po poker player at the table is the one that can deceive the best. Right? That's acceptable at the poker table. It's a, it transcends the poker table into just life in general. It's me and mine. So we see that sin in the New Covenant law, we see this exceedingly sinfulness of sin, Romans 7. And then in theirs, Old Covenant, and in our new covenant inability to answer his justice and holiness by keeping old covenant law it in its entirety. That's the difference between a new covenant believer and an old covenant man. The difference is the old covenant man still thinks, holds out hope, that he can still somehow through the abilities of his own self and his own goodness and his own good desire to be like God, he thinks he can do it through the law. But the new covenant believer understands that doing a law doesn't do it. Because if I fail in one of those laws, then I have not accomplished what it was that God wanted me to accomplish. That's the difference between the old covenant sometimes Old Covenant, New Covenant believer, and the New Covenant believer in Christ. Don't you think Moses even was trying to get this through to them, though, at the end when he was like, choose life and death? Yeah. That's why I made a point to say Moses, even though he was a lawgiver, God had revealed from to his humble heart, most humble man around, humble heart, his, his other attributes. Not to, the, not to the rest of Israel did he reveal himself, but to Moses he did. He is his friend. You know, not in the same sense that Abraham was his friend, but he was a close companion who he had spent a lot of time in the presence of his, of his clouded glory, not in his real presence. And so, yeah, I do believe that the Moses had, as David had, an understanding that, that far exceeded the typical grassroots understanding. I shouldn't even say grassroots. I should say religious leaders. That their understanding. David, after his sin with Bathsheba, said what? If, 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 if I, I would kill all the cattle in Israel if I thought that it would appease God. But that's not what he wants. He wants a humble heart, a contrite heart. He wants to, me to repent and be sorry for my sin. That far exceeded the understanding of your religious mindset. And God affirmed that by even later calling him the, you know, the man after his own heart. So yes, I do believe that Moses was uh, in that it just as that day he left in the last chapter of Deuteronomy and he was preaching to them and, and, and exhorting them and, and telling them what, what, the, what he saw they were going to do. You're not going to stick with this. You're not going to hang in there. 
you're, you're going you're gonna to fall away. But don't despair because God's going to send another one in my place. He's going to send Jesus. That's that transition. What do you want to go back for? What do you want to go back here for? Why? Why? It's not that. It, it's not. It's a tadpole. It's not. Come on. Let's move forward with the Lord. So we, we understand the weakness then of our flesh, right? It's the overpowering strength of our flesh, really that he calls the weakness of our flesh. It's the over and out powering flesh. Th that that I, I, I want to do, but I can't. That's that overpowering flesh. It is Cain, far exceeding in strength and age and experience over his younger, smaller brother Abel. It's, it's him every day awakening and trying to figure out how he can kill his brother until he does. He's unrelenting. Man, he, man establish, once we establish these things in the New Covenant believer, he establishes our critical need for the grace. I'm talking about New Covenant now, see? Because uh, what the old covenant law brought was a, it, it brought a weight on the conscience that required those that were that, felt that way to the conscience to bring or draw nigh to God, bring a sacrifice and an offering to make it right with God. Well, in the new covenant, it's the same kind of, of dynamic in that the way to the conscience, and now sin's even more wicked, now more, all these things are now brought to bear on the heart, and we, we also have an offering. We also have an ability and a way to draw nigh unto God. And it's through the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And it's drawing, and when we do that, we draw upon the grace, the outpouring, the divine influence on the heart of the Holy Spirit to not only forgive us and atone, but forget the sin and empower us, enable us further in the new creation to become more like Christ, having all the attributes of God, so that now we might be with God. Not in some holding tank in the middle of the earth. That's all it is. Because these things have not been fully realized. It's still in transition. It went from here to here, and it will go to there in the glory. It'll happen. Are you all following me? So that finally, the New Covenant believer establishes, we establish in ourselves our critical need for the grace. We don't receive, we don't receive the message of cheap grace. We don't receive the message that Jesus did it all. We understand that that's, that's, uh, uh, that's antinomianism, that that's what John, 1 John 1 speaks to, that, 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 that a perversion of God. We understand that, that it's not antinomianism and that there's not cheap grace and that Christ didn't cover all things. And if you say you are without sin, you're a liar. We don't buy that, but we buy there is a grace. There is, a, uh, uh, there is something, which I'll put, make as a person, there is a spirit that we can draw upon that will allow us to enter back into fellowship with Christ. And it had nothing to do with the tadpole. It had nothing to do with the beginning. It has something to do with the transition. So we see that critical need for grace, the power of influence upon the heart, in the truth of the fullness of the salvation plan, the the fullness of what God's intent was in the salvation plan to bring new covenant sons unto God. See? Sons unto God. That's God's plan. Sons unto God. I read the scripture there in John. I remember what verse it was. That was the witness of John for John the Baptist when saying that 
He said, Behold the Lamb of God. No, it says the Lamb of God as a contrast to the land, Lamb of Man. What's the Lamb of Man? The Lamb of Man is that that, that, that the Israelite laid his hand on and, and, and through him was, was, was able to draw unto God. That's the Lamb of, of Man. Now, God has a Lamb. And that's the testimony of John the Baptist. Behold, the Lamb of God. And he meant it in the way I'm saying it. He meant it as that's God's offering for man. Oh, well, we all know that. Yeah, we don't know it, though. We don't know what degree. Well, that, we don't know what the implications of what he said and what God, Christ did are. We, we, think it, we take it on this real surface level. Yeah, he is the Lamb of God for me. So be it, so it's done, so it's written. I am. But just like the Israelite who laid his hand on that innocent animal to transfer his guilt and his sin, his heart had to be in line with that for it to be effective. So it is when we lay our hand on, on Christ's head, and we, we have to have that in us that recognizes humbly, contritely, in, in the blood of what it did for us. And have in mind, have in mind this progression of becoming more like him. Right? Is God satisfied with your, forgive me in the name of Jesus, 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 every day, forgive me in the name of Jesus, forgive me in the name of Jesus. He, he, he doesn't hear it. <laughs> There's no weight in there. There's no, there wasn't any weight laid on your conscience. You weren't like David who was on his face crying and weeping with a broken heart because of what he did. You weren't like that. Forgive me in the name of Jesus. 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 And you think that that's what you're doing. And you think that's what God has authorized you to do when he says come in to the throne room to obtain mercy and grace. You think that that's what you're doing, but you're not. We got it in type right here. He said don't let don't any man think in his own heart that he can do what he wants. He can say this and do another thing. He can't, because he knows the heart. You're, forgive me in the name of Jesus, and then you're, oh, uh, and then five minutes later, you're conspiring with the devil how you can do it again. Yes? Uh, the Lamb of Man, that's kind of like an outward sacrifice, which equals to works, but the Lamb of God is the inward sacrifice, and that equals to the character change. Yeah, let me, let me back up and see if I heard you. What did you say about the Albert? The Lamb of Man? Yeah. That said outward, outward sacrifice? Oh, outward. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Yeah. And the Lamb of God? Yeah. Which takes away the sin of the world, that's the Lamb of God. Yeah, that's, that trans that's transition. Yeah. See, over here, we got, we got a lot of outward working. Mm -hmm. uh, because this is all the power of the blood. This is, only, this is the blood here can, can, can't get you any deeper. But there's, God's pointing at something through these types and shadows, but he's pointing us to the blood that has the ability to work on the internal, and which has an impact on our outward works. The Lamb of God, as opposed to the Lamb of Man. And again, we're not speaking in terms of salvation here. We're speaking in terms of inheritance. Glory, reward, prize. We're, not, we're, we're talking about how to attain unto that place with Christ, of ruling and reigning as his bride. We're not talking about how that, that you have to do the things that I'm saying to attain unto justification. The attainment unto justification is a one-time event. That that I'm talking to you about now is a process. 
It's a process. It's a process that John went through. It's a process that Paul went through. It's a process that Peter went through. They all went through a process to, to sit on those 12 thrones. It was nothing just handed over to them. Behold, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God. Now we understand from the Word of God that no jot of Moses or the prophets can fail. Is that not right? The Word says it. Jesus said it. It cannot fail. But note this. It has not failed if fulfilled or filled with meaning. It's not failed if it's fulfilled. That, that tadpole that turned into the frog didn't fail. He, 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 he went through the transition and never once did he want to be back to be a tadpole. He, all, he understood that in the transition it was the intent of, of the seed to be a frog. So it didn't fail. The, the, the words of Christ the words of the Torah, the words of the Old Covenant didn't fail when He filled them with meaning. They just transcended. They just made a transition. They went from the, the tadpole to the frog. I like what Cindy says. It, it, it is, you know, in, your, in the woman's womb, how, how, look at that thing. It looks like a tadpole, doesn't it? It looks like this little thing. It's got, you know. But look what comes forth. And, and it don't stop here. We're still in transition, aren't we? We were here, and now, now we were in. They actually started in, in, in the mind of God. And then we were here, and then we're here, and then we'll be there. It's a transition. You can't get fixated on any part of it until you reach the final product. Which 1 Corinthians 15 says, it talks about the resurrection. Some will be resurrected in one glory and others will be resurrected in another glory. Some will be frogs, some will be rabbits. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Something like that. Actually, it said moon and stars and sun. So he used a different analogy. But I'm using frogs and rabbits and... As long as we understand there is this transition. That's the idea. That's what I'm trying to elevate Christ and what he did into its proper perspective and, and, and let us see how if we don't move with him in the transition, in a way, we're denying him. Which I hope to make... Is the sun bright? Is that the transition? I, I think that, that that is not a bad way of looking at, but I would put servant slash son. Servant slash son. Not, you, you, because even when you're son, you're a servant. Jesus Christ was a son, but he was a servant of God. Servant slash son. Bright. No learned Christian denies that the Lamb of Offering represented in Old Covenant is fulfilled and is filled with its intended meaning in Jesus Christ. Wow, it would, it would just seem foreign to any Christian to say that, no, that isn't what that Lamb represented in the Old Covenant. No, 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 you got it all wrong. There, the, you won't, I don't know if I've ever heard a word against the fact that everybody, every denominational belief will tell you from a pulpit that that lamb in the Old Covenant is representative of that lamb, Jesus Christ, won't they? They don't have any problem with that. They, they see that transition, but they don't see it. They don't see it clearly. They don't see what he, what he took with him, what he pulled with him. They don't see the rest of his filling with meaning and fulfilling of the Old Covenant. They saw, see that one little teeny piece and they'll say, yeah, and then they'd leave everything else. You've you, you got to lasso them and drag them forward so they can see that there's more to 
this typing and shadowing and transitioning than Jesus just being the Lamb of God. Although I would say that was the, probably the most important thing for them to get a hold of, but if you stay there, you're still, you're still a tadpole. Jim? Isn't it equal that if you have man's lamb and you sacrifice and God accepts it, it's just momentary that it can move the guilt. If you only believe in Jesus as Savior and you stop and you never go on to death and sanctification and so on, then you don't have a relationship or a process. You just have a one-time event and the guilt is gone, but there's no growth out of it. There's no life that comes from it. There's no real meaning or being. There's no spirit at all. So isn't it exactly the same? What they did, got rid of their guilt momentarily, then they had to do it again and again and again. But in Christ Jesus, God's lamb, it's permanent, it's forever, but it's a process, it's a relationship. You can't unhook and stop it. It's a continual application. It's a continual application uh, uh, unto glory. And that, I think, probably, Jim, that word in, in our ears probably fails to say what that really, the significance of glory is. We, so we say it and we kind of say, yeah, that's something better than a candy bar. But, yeah, it, it, but it, that's what's required there to get into the glory. But the problem is so, so, so much of Christian already believes that they have everything that, that a, 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 appertains to glory. They, they, don't, they don't see it. They think that in that justifying one-time eternal life experience that they received all of what God had to offer. Never saw the exceeding, exceeding sinfulness in themselves. Matter of fact, they, they, they live their lives with grace under their feet. That's essentially what you do is you just live with the grace that God gave you as a gift, you live with it under your feet. Look and see the servants. How did God judge them? How did he judge them? So, so wouldn't that be witchcraft? <laughs> that we started in the spirit through the new prophet, through Jesus, through the Lamb of God. But then we just fell back the same as was done before yeah. and never moved. Yeah. And where in an old covenant type, you would see someone who brought a lamb or bull to, to the priest and, and, and decided to corban and draw nigh unto God and did. He did that one time. And then the remaining part of his rest of his life, he did not. So you could say that he fell from grace, which is the same point that Paul makes in Galatians chapter 2 and 3 in that if you try to do this in the law of Moses, which is moving backwards, then you'll fall from grace. So there is an application, there is a process, but it's not in the old covenant. It's not in, it's not in the observance of the old covenant that we find grace. It's in the new covenant that we find the grace the design, divine influence upon the heart. We don't find it in the old covenant. You, you couldn't, if you could have, you, we, they would have made a law that would have allowed you to have grace in the old covenant. Isn't that what he said? If the righteousness could have come from the old covenant, there would have been grace there to bring that righteousness. But there wasn't, and there still isn't. I don't care how much of it you do. You'll never find God's grace and peace in the old covenant. It's a new covenant experience that comes with the more efficacy of the blood of Jesus Christ alone, exclusively. That's the, that's the truth of the gospel that everybody thinks that they know, but no one knows. They're not experiencing it. It's not being applied. They're not becoming Christ-like. They're just living a lie. You know, just like Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, they're... They belie the truth. They say, yeah, there's a God, but their actions and their life belie the very truths that they're saying. They live in the death. It's living in the death of Christ and not moving on to the Spirit. I mean, like Hebrews 10, it says, For anyone who, who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of the witnesses. Just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God 
and have treated the blood of the covenant which made us holy as if it were common and unholy and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit yeah. who brings God's mercy to us. It's not moving into the Spirit. It's staying in the death, remaining under the blood, not moving to the Spirit. That's right. Not transitioning. Not transitioning. Well, like Jim was saying, you use it for an abracadabra. Yeah, and it's witchcraft. Abracadabra over me, I, I'm no longer a frog, I'm a prince. Kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't have to transition from a frog. A frog and a prince are the same. Yeah. That's good, Cindy. I like that. Tadpole, frog, prince. <laughs> Tadpole's old. In the, in the present, we find the frog. In the future, we find the prince. In the meantime, in the meantime, you're a tadpole. You know, you're waving your hand over. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a prince. I'm a prince. I'm a prince. You know? Believe it and it will happen. Yeah. Believe it. It's yours. Confess it. Brings possession. Uh, that, that's exactly that scripture's application. Of course, when we were, we were all in steeped in once saved, always saved, we, that we kind of kind of had a problem with that, but when when you understand the gift and the prize, you no longer have a prize, pri problem with understanding that scripture. It comes to light. It makes perfectly good sense. I'm not going to get. I'm not going to get something I don't deserve. I'm going to get what I deserve. But fortunately, God gives me the ability to do now what it is that He calls me to do. So every. Uh, every jot and tittle of the of the old covenant, it, it, it has to be, it has to, it's not, it's not going to just pass away. It's not going to just, you're not going to abolish it. It, 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 it it's, it's swallowed up. I like the way Cindy said, you, you swallow it, you know, you swallow it. It's swallowed up, but it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it retains its significance. It, do, it doesn't, it's not of, uh, you know, it, it hasn't been abolished. It has been filled with meaning. That was its purpose. It finally transitioned from here to here. And in this sense, this particular old covenant shadow has passed away into the reality. I'm talking about, behold, the Son of God. The Lamb of God. I'm, t I'm talking about now that Lamb that the old Israelite was laying. It now has been transitioned. It has now been filled with meaning. The, the Lamb is still back here. But now we have the understanding of the transition of we see what it is now fulfilled in meaning. You didn't, you, it's why you don't see it, any commandments in the New Covenant to to Corban, an animal, unto God. Because he's provided the lamb. All right, we all know that. But back up in, and, and apply that same principle to the rest of these vague uh, religious understandings you have as to what's Old Covenant, what's New Covenant, mixing them together. Well, we, if you can establish that what I'm saying is true, the Lamb of God was a type. It's the, uh, the Lamb of God was a type of the Lamb of Man. And now it's passed away. It's, came, it's fulfilled. It's filled with meaning. Now get a hold of that and you can take the next step. Somebody raise their hand. So that's what I'm saying. And this is the sense. And in this sense, this particular old covenant shadow has passed away into the reality. And in full recognition of that, no harm or no, no harm, only honor has come to Scripture. How did Christ, fulfilling that, harm Scripture? How did it, you know, how did it uh, do it any dishonor? It didn't. He fulfilled what it was intent and purpose was. And it leaves this, it's a, uh, leaving the Old Covenant Scripture intact for the next to discover its relevance maintained. That's what I mean. He didn't take the lamb away. You see it? It's still there. You, in your, 
in your heart and mind, you transitioned into this importance of the new uh, Lamb of God. But you didn't, you didn't abolish the Lamb. It's still left there. You're just not with that Lamb no more. You left the Lamb for who? I left the Lamb for you, Scott. I left the land back here. It's still a type. It's still a shadow. And you still haven't transitioned. You still need this lamb to understand this. See? It hasn't lost its significance. It's still there. It's still available. It's still being used by God. Do you see it? It's not. We're not abolishing. We're not getting away. We're doing away with. We're, we're fulfilling. We're seeing a, a Christ what he did. And then the real light of what he did. Not some nebulous, some things picked out and some things left and we'll do this and that and we don't know why. It's very distinct when you have, the, if God imparts to us the revelation, the understanding of the transition. Truth-seeking Christians must learn how to rightly divide Old Covenant and New Covenant Scripture. Gosh, and have I never seen it more obvious than watching the talk heads who say that they're Christians and, and one saying this and one saying that and one saying this, one using Old Covenant Scripture and one using this Scripture and New Covenant Scripture. And, one, you know, who knows what Christians are? Who knows what they believe? Who, who can tell? No one. It's such a hodgepodge a mixture of everything and anything. It's so indistinct. And it makes indistinct people. It begets them. That's what we are. We're indistinct. We ain't got nobody to point to and say, now that's a Christian. You know, those oldest talk heads and so forth, that seeing themselves in the light of a real Christian, they don't have that. So they think they are. Their peer or maybe their teacher or whoever, and, and they feel like they're in the same category. They compare themselves one to another. It's an absolute mess. And that's why I say it's critical. A lot of this indistinctness comes from the leaven of not rightly dividing the Word of God. That's where it came from. Because there's confusion, because it wasn't rightly divided. Well, it wasn't just the natural order of things. It took an enemy who sowed inside the wheat field a bunch of tares. And he did a good job. And what a mess! Matter of fact, you, it's, it, it, that there's so much tares that you think that it's wheat. <laughs> so we have a pillar to post. It just saddens my heart. It just breaks my heart. Is there no Christianity in the earth? Not really. Will I come? Will I find any true Christianity? The law of Moses reveals sin or leaven and then lays it as a weight upon our conscience in order to unsettle us. I always used to say, you know, if you don't have an adversary, the Holy Spirit will be it. He volunteers. I'll be your adversary. Why? Because the law of Moses reveals sin and then lays it as a weight upon our conscience in order to unsettle us. Is that wrong? If this is awareness of sin, if this awareness of sin then is upon us, justice must be answered. Otherwise, it becomes a seared conscience. Or we will suffer justice's decree. Whatever the justice is that's been decreed by God for that sin is what we will receive. So turning to meet that justice in Christ brings grace and peace. Whoa, didn't you just mix covenants? No, not really. I left the lamb over there. There's still the lamb over there. You see, you see what I'm saying? I, I left the old covenant law. Over, I left the Ten Commandments over there. I mean, I transitioned. But I left the Ten Commandments over there for you, Scott. Because you haven't transitioned yet. You ain't seen it yet. You ain't seen the blood of the Lamb leads the blood of the Lamb. You ain't seen the commandments of the old covenant in the new covenant. You haven't seen that yet. So I leave them. And so when it says, thou shalt not kill, 
over here, and it convicts Scott, thou shalt not kill, that can be the weight of the Holy Spirit upon your heart, upon your conscience that changes, converts you, and makes you repent so that you don't have to answer to that justice that of thou shalt not kill. While you're doing that, that's fine. The Holy Spirit used that, does use it, according to the Word of God. But I transition in here. Now when I hear thou shalt not kill, I hear thou shalt not kill and you, because you'll be in, in the face of judgment. You'll be in the, in, the, in the face of judgment. I say unto you that if you hate your brother, it is the same as murder and you have stand in face of judgment. What judgment? The same judgment as thou shalt not kill, only now he's elevated it elevated it up here and I'm living now in a different in a different arena than you are you see it so so the transition and understanding that that you aren't mixing covenants I'm not going out if evangelistically I wouldn't go out here and say thou shall not kill I wouldn't take them to the the Exodus, I wouldn't read them the Ten Commandments. I'd not to, I'd take them to Matthew chapter 5 and 6. And, I, and I'd say, it was written, but... It is written, but... You see it? And from the very get-go, uh, from the pulpit, we have started to mix in the thinking of those who are teaching, the, 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 we're, trying, we're mixing together the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Because we don't have a clear understanding of the transition. So one's preaching over here that all homosexuals should be killed, according to Leviticus, I think 11. They all should be killed. Over here, we have in the New Covenant, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we have those that are uh, participating in such like activities will not be in the kingdom of God. And so we have New Covenant believers who are preaching that you're going to hell over here. Over here we're preaching they need to be killed and sent to hell. We don't even want them to let them live over here long enough to live their life out. We're killing them now. But over here, we're nice Christians, and we're going to let them live, but they're going to go to hell. In the meantime, we're going to try to convert them to keep them out of hell. Am I, am I, talking, am I saying it right? Am I, you making, am I making sense? Are they either one of them right? Neither one of them are right. <laughs> because it isn't, kingdom hell cannot be equated, kingdom heaven cannot be equated with the hell. Yeah, the kingdom is the kingdom of Christ. It's the millennial reign. It's ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ as his bride. That's the, a homosexual won't enter into that. But don't tell me that a homosexual can't be born again. That's, that's the other whole... Exactly. There, that's why I say a hodgepodge. It's a hodgepodge. Where's the, where's the reality? Where's the truth? We're, it's right here, right here in front of us, but we're not, we don't understand it. So we, uh, uh, New Covenant followers think, no, that's not right. We're not supposed to kill. That's Old Covenant. That's what this guy would be saying, right? That's Old Covenant. We're not supposed to kill. We just need to tell them they're going to hell. We're not supposed to kill them. Right? That's wrong. That's not what a Christian is. It's not what Christ said. It's not what he represented. And that's not what we should represent. So how does the world who's just wondering what is Christianity about, what are they to believe? Old covenant's passed away. It's gone away. It doesn't have any significance. It, we're in the new covenant. It's only the new covenant that matters. And that's that other stuff, all those punishments and all that uh, harshness of God is gone. It's all love in Christ now. And uh, amen? Amen. Okay, pass the offering. Oh, we want to get your tithes. We want to get your tithes. The old covenant's passed away, but oh, we want to get your tithes. What? I thought you just said, well, it has passed away as it relates to punishment, but you're still obligated to tithe. Oh, gosh, I'm so confused. What is it? Is it Old Covenant? Uh, what is this? 
What? Here's the truth. It's right here. But we're not here. We're not here. You know, we've we, we got a hodgepodge. We don't understand what Christ said. He fulfilled tithing. He fulfilled it. How did he fulfill it? He filled it. He gave all. How are we to follow? We're to give all. We're not to give 10%. We're to give all. There's no, you'll not find a place in the Bible where it says give 10% in the new covenant. It is not the reality of the new covenant. It's a misinterpreted, mismanaged hodgepodge of understandings that don't speak to Christ. Y'all went to preaching instead of teaching. Did somebody raise their hand that I ignored? <laughs> when he says that the law was not done away with, to so me it really is, um, the law defines God's justice. So when you... Um, when Paul spoke to a Gentile and he's bringing them to the Lord, he, he used the law as the foundation of Scripture. But it had, but when Jesus said that not one jot or tittle would be done away with, how else can we define his, his justice without the law? doesn't mean that we're still under the old covenant, but we have to have that law. We have to have that foundation. All laws have a foundation. So we have to... We're defining who God is, and we're defining sin, defining His holiness and His justice, so that we have, that's what points us to the need for a Messiah. So, to me, the argument is not, to, the old covenant has been done away with, but the definition of who God is, do you understand what I'm saying? Of who He is. The, the, who He is, is listed in the law. Who he is, is listed in the new covenant law. Here is, we see his justice and holiness. Here we see all of his attributes. The necessity for this was for a purpose, which has been filled with meaning in Christ. Our laws are here. They're not here. They're, the only one law is one we should need is love your neighbor as yourself. And love God, right? That's really the only law that you need. You don't need all this rest of this law. So if our, our laws come from Christ's words, whatever he spoke, it takes ascendancy and authority over this. Can this be used to put a weight upon the heart? Yes. But hopefully the Holy Spirit can transition you from thinking that the old covenant law is something that you should observe and do to bringing you into the realities of, is a shadow, bringing you into the realities of Christ's words. Because hear ye him. Because it is he who filled this all with meaning. And it's the spirit who fulfills the words of Christ in us. He doesn't fulfill, the Holy Spirit, is, grace on our hearts is not being brought to bear because of we're observing something over here. You can't get that that we need here from here because it doesn't it's incompatible you, in other words you can't have two authorities you don't have one authority well, what I'm saying is it's like when someone approaches me about homosexuality because I've had quite a few debates on it I have to be able to go back to the wall to, to show why homosexuality is a sin why it's an abomination to God I have to have that definition, definition, what defines homosexuality and why it is confused. What you have to have is the lamb yeah. to define this, lamb. Okay. Doesn't it all that's, that's, that's the end of it. You, 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 you still are, this is still applicable. It's still historically applicable. It's still all of the ways that it's still applicable. But it isn't what we look to for truth and grace. This we look to for a understanding from seeing the, the beginning to the transition. Well, how did that happen? What happened? Now, why did it happen? Well, oh, here it is. And we see that in the Lamb. We see that in the examples of the Word. But it's not what we 
we apply ourselves or order our lives according to. Because we're looking for a, a greater grace that can only be obtained in this new covenant transition, not anything back here. We can't get anything out of it other than historical information, other than uh, uh, ability to witness and testify, a will, uh, ability to, to show the typing the shadows, a, will, a way to see the historical significance, a way to see what's coming from the prophets. Right? Two-thirds of the, of the prophetic word in the Torah has not been fulfilled yet. So we're certainly looking there to see what, 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 is, what is going to be fulfilled in the future, especially as it relates to Israel. Because they, Israelites, the prophets that wrote it, were skewed to a th thinking that had to do with earthly kingdom. So we look at that and we say it and we try, and then as new covenant believers, what we do is we go over there and grab that out of the old covenant and apply it to ourselves as if that's what, you know, the church now gets all the prophets. No, 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 you don't understand it. All of those things are still applicable to the, to the old covenant. But in the transition, now we see the heavenly kingdom we see the, the ruling and reigning with Christ from the heavenly place. We don't have to rob them. We don't have to take those blessings that are theirs in the old covenant. We, we actually went through the transition and we see what Christ did for us. All things fall into place and make sense with a proper dividing of the word of God. Couldn't you say the old is valid but incomplete? You, you can validate yeah. Use it. Yeah. You can't just because it's incomplete. It yeah. has to be linked to it, hooked to the next transition yeah. in order for yeah. it to, yeah. to have any effectiveness. Or... Right. To have its intended purpose. Exactly. You know, the, the Old Covenant has its intended purpose, and the New Covenant has its intended purpose. And what happens is we lose the, old, the New Covenant purpose when we concentrate on the Old Covenant purpose. About Romans, though, I mean, you mentioned Romans earlier, 7, 6 through 11, and it talks about how the law gave sin power and taught us that we would have to die. The law brought death. Its commands killed me, even though it's holy, right, and good. It uses God's commands for its own evil purposes. I mean, that's the synopsis of what that says. Yeah. So it was there to teach us. The law was to teach us, but... In teaching us, it showed us that that death is required. We have to die. And then the only way to come back to life is to go through the process and allow the spirit to work from inside of us. To draw upon that, to meet the justice in the new covenant. You want to understand that, we look at Galatians. The, the, those Galatians had, had what we try to do. They... They did what we're trying to do. They're trying to mix the old covenant law with the new. But you, you can't imagine Paul or whoever evangelized those Galatians without the old covenant. You know, you, you know that they evangelized with the old covenant. Let, let, me, let me explain. He explained it to the Jews every Sunday or Saturday on synagogue. You know, he, he argued the points of why we, the whole book of Hebrews is a, nothing but a transition. It just explains the transition to the Jew. So the Gentile has knowledge. I, I'm Paul. I'm teaching you. I say, here, here's, here in the beginning, God created. And then go from there. I say, now, these lamb sacrifices, let me tell you what they represent. They represent Jesus Christ, they, and he, he uses them. Thou shalt not kill. Actually, it goes beyond that in the New Covenant. The, the Lord said, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not hate thy brother, which equates to killing. Paul used all of that to bring them to here. Now they're here, and somebody comes in there, some Judaizer, and says, oh, by the way, all of that, but you've got to be circumcised. That's true. All of that's true. All of that that Paul's been teaching is true. But you got to be circumcised. See? Now we find from Paul the truth about trying to mix the covenants. Now, and he didn't mince words, he tore them up. Well, let him cut the whole self off. I mean, he was tough. Did he, did he say, oh, oh, I understand, yeah, you know, 
And it says so in the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant, you know, we can't just, we can't just uh, go against what it says. You know, we've got, we got to make sure we allow it its place. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I guess you're, they're right. You've got to be circumcised. I didn't want to tell you that's the bad news. <laughs> that isn't what he said. It, it, it isn't what I'm saying. I'm, I'm saying, hey, we're not to do, observe the Old Covenant. We're to understand what has been transitioned, what's been fulfilled with meaning, and then we're to move on. We're to take that and understand it as it applies to us in the new covenant. But there's no way you can draw from that, observing that, and obeying that, and draw upon the new covenant grace of the Holy Spirit. Won't happen. Can't happen. Because He come to reveal Christ and the Father. He came to reveal Christ, the Father, and the Spirit. That's the new covenant. The old covenant didn't have that. You're not going to go back to the old covenant. Come on now. I don't have to go any further. Am I hammer on something that's already sunk deep in a board, isn't it? I hope it is. I forget now where I was. Am I only on page two? Yes. God, give Carl strength. <laughs> Okay, brother. Goodness great, I can't believe I'm on page two. Well, we're obviously not going to get finished with this lesson, but that's okay. As long as we're all going in the, pulling in the same direction here, and I sense that we are, even though some are a little few feet behind, we're still all pulling down this, this trail. The Christ himself, the Spirit of God, is here to try to, to understand, make us understand these things. So here's the unholy conflict that we've been talking about. It's the confusing of the old covenant type and the shadow that has been fulfilled or filled with meaning in the new covenant and answering to justice served in old covenant. Now stop there and let that swallow, let that chew, let that finally get there. And answering to justice served in old covenant what were some of the old covenant justices? I just, in this I typed literally at about 20 after 12. So, you know, I, I didn't have a chance to really focus it in and really say what I mean, so I'm going to have to speak to it. But there's, there, what answers to the justice in the old covenant does not answer to justice in the new covenant? Let me put it that way. In the old covenant, it warranted wars. It warranted killing. Right? And it authorized an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. It authorized tithing. It authorized observing the Sabbath day, feasts, etc. Those are all, all observances of the old covenant that had a penalty or they were sanctioned. Are you with me? These teach new those that teach new that should say those that teach new covenant principles and the meeting of justice on some levels, while yet maintaining much old covenant observance in its original shadowing application, which being contrary to was sin in the old covenant, but in the filling up of meaning in Christ is not. Now that's just the cold hard facts of the matter. You can't kill in the new covenant. Sorry, you can't. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jim. I'm glad you're, 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 you're into it. Let me have it. Knock me down. What word? I mean, old or new covenant. Okay. I'll give it to you in the new covenant where he says, and my word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And yeah. 13, 8, and yeah. back on Isaiah 43, 3, he said, my, God says, my word is forever. Yeah. Uh, what would be uh, the... Uh, He's a tadpole. Pardon? He's a tadpole. What you're saying is God's a tadpole. <laughs> okay. There's no, no transition in God. Right. Whatever he said, it literally is what he meant. And whatever he said, literally, is what you interpret him to have said in the Old Covenant. So he, he remains there. He can't transition. 
He can't move forward. He can't, his word can't grow. It can't expand. He's got to be right there and he's got to, whatever he said, that's what he's got to do from here on out. Never can he change. And he doesn't change. There's no shadow turning in him. But he, 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 he adds, he, he multiplies, he makes exponential. He, he does lots of things that never get out of the perimeters of his word. And because he said in the Old Covenant, thou shalt not kill, okay, but what, he, what he's saying there is thou shalt not murder, right? Mm -hmm. But he sanctioned some killing. In the, why did he give divorce? If, if God never changed, never changed, whatever he said is me. Well, today we can say, Patty, you're divorced, you're divorced, you're divorced, she's done. Because God never changes. He never changes. He's... He said in the Old Covenant that he, he authorized divorce. You're, you, you're subject to divorce. For, for whatever whim I, I, I consider, you know, disobedience or whatever. See? See, see, the, see the, the frailty of your argument? No. The, uh... Okay. <laughs> I, I, your point is, is that if God said in the Old Covenant some things and His Word never passes, then they're applicable in the New Covenant, right? Uh, yeah, the New Covenant is in Hebrew. In what? In Hebrew 13, 8, Jesus said, My word is the same yesterday and today and forever. Right. He is the same. He is the same. He is the same. It's not a, it's not a confliction. It's not a confliction for him to have said that this here and this here. It's not a confliction. It's a transition. It's a growth. He's not contradicted himself in any way by bringing something that was old covenant where I can't divorce for nearly practically any reason to you can't divorce unless one reason. That, that he, didn't, he didn't conflict himself. He just moved. He transitioned because his heart was always that we were to be bound together let no man to, to divide us asunder. In the beginning, God didn't intend that men would kill each other. And so he, he, his intent in his word wasn't to Make allowances so that, that people can kill one another. That, that's not the, the fullness of what his heart's desire, his word, would imply. So when you try to take an old covenant, self-defense scripture, and bring it in a new covenant, you have to do it in contrasting all the rest of the word of the new covenant, where it says walk another mile, turn another cheek, whenever does you anybody any evil, then you return good. Take no thought for a suffered wrong. You have to do away with all of those, Jerry, to get to where you're wanting to go, which is authorizing lethal killing for self-defense. And you ain't, you ain't going to get there because you have to put down every other scripture, totally ignore, and just have that one scripture to authorize yourself to do something contrary to God's will. If you have the intent in your heart to kill, you're not being a Christian. Protection is killing. I don't know where it says anything about lions and tigers. I know where it says about, the, about human beings. I know you don't want to, but you would you? Then, then you know, wouldn't be in a Christian. Uh, you wouldn't be. Uh, you weren't exercising Christian values. You weren't exercising the commandments of Christ. Oh, that's what I said. Who can do this? Who, who, you know, I'm surprised there's this many people here after the last few weeks of me yeah, teaching. If somebody, if somebody came at my kids, my child, trying to kill them, there's no doubt I would pull my gun out and I would kill them. Not that I have an intent in my heart to murder people, but I'm going to protect that child. So, yes, it is very, very difficult. I'm still struggling with that. Well, let me continue. The fact is, the Lord said, how did he say to pray? Pray after this manner. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. Lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. Brother, that's the new covenant defense right there. It isn't here. It isn't here. If you're trusting in your arm, you're trusting in the old covenant. And you won't have the grace in the new covenant. You can't have that duplicity. You can't have in your mind, I'll kill, and uh, I'm also uh, going to get the new covenant grace to be a Christian. It's, it's a contradictory statement to say that you'll kill in the face of anything. 
in your heart. It's not Christian. Christ died. He got killed. He, well, he could have killed them all, but he didn't. He, he died, but he authorized you to kill. No, I don't think so. I, I don't think that's Christ-like. Because it's a death that he's asking us to come to. It's a place of servitude. It's a place where now we're exhibiting all the attributes of God. Not just justice and holiness. Now we're expressing love. How? Oh, I'm going to lay my life down for you. I'm going to die for you. But what about my children? Well, I'm not going in there because there's a lot of giants in the land. And they're going to kill my children. I'm not going in there. I'm not going to risk my children. I'm not going to be a true Christian if it's risking my children. Well, that, you don't have to worry about entering into the kingdom. Do you correlate? Do you see it? And it's not about your salvation. <laughs> it's not about salvation. It's about becoming like Christ and, and, and taking on the death of the new covenant of Christ and applying it to your life. Oh, my God. How, is it easy? No. But we're, that's, we're so full of hodgepodge of duplicity, where that thinking comes from is old covenant thinking. It's mixed into your new covenant theology. You mix them up. Depends what you want to believe, what you want to hear, what you want to do, what's convenient for you. I, I'm going I'm to take an old covenant scripture if it helps me prove the point, blah, blah. But I'm going to take a new covenant scripture if it proves that I can do blah, blah. You won't take the whole counsel of God. Be why? Because it's too hard. It's too hard. That's what, what's what they said, right? It's too hard. I won't do that. I'm with you, Brandy. I'm with you. I understand. <laughs> I understand. You know, I had a gun under my bed. I did, I did, I did. I understand. I wasn't intending to kill anybody. I don't want to kill anybody. Pray to God I don't have to kill anybody. But I was set to kill somebody. Okay. And God has called us on. God has called me on. I don't know about y'all. I'm, I'm screaming. But he's calling us on to a different kind of life than we've ever experienced before. It's not one that we can mix this old covenant beliefs into to make our, our covenant. We make our covenant. Now, this is the covenant of the Lord, and this is what he said. Read his words, and we're going to find there's no sanction for a killing, much less sanction for murdering. There's no sanctions for killing. What about, what about, what about? You can take a here and a there, and you can take it, and you can piecemeal together your theology if you want to, but if you take the whole counsel of God, and you see the transition, and you see what he's trying to do, and you see what he's trying to impart to you, how can you say, I have, I have run the race? I have run the race. And now it's laid up for me or the crown. If you guarded in your own heart any type, any made, it regarded any sin against God. Note, note what Paul went through and not once does it say that he reviled. Note what Peter went through. Note what John went through. Note what every one of the disciples of Christ went through. You think any of them had opportunity to return evil for evil? No. Yeah, every one of them. There's no place in the new covenant for killing. As it relates to kingdom inheritance, not as it relates to eternal life. I'm saying, oh, I have many friends, and I tried to get into service myself. I tried to join all of them, but I couldn't join any of them. But I understand going, serving your country, so forth, so on. I understand that. But the message I'm bringing to you, it's going to cause a lot. It causes a lot of heat for me. But it's still the truth. It's still the reality. I can back it up with the Word of God, and it's not easy, and it's hard. It's hard to speak, and that's hard to talk, and that's why you don't ever hear it. You're not going to hear this message anywhere because they don't want to make you mad. They don't want to disturb you. They want to make sure things stay pretty much on even keel. Just start these kind of messages I've been teaching the last three or four weeks and see what happens in a regular congregation. <laughs> not people that have been kind of sensitized to my 
way of thinking. Don't mean to cut you off, Jerry. I just, I just know where you're going with that because I've had it thrown at me so much in my life. You know, I said a lot of these, lot of these decisions that I've made in my, in my life were a long time ago, that, but but I'm just now emboldened to bring them up because I look out here and it's just going it, to, we're going to get robbed of our inheritance because that that sneaky one is going to deceive us. He's going to deceive us and we end up on losing our, our inheritance. We'll, we'll get the gift, but we'll lose our inheritance. And I'm, I'm telling you, when the Lord told me, Mike, your defense is me, your trust is me, and he said, what do you think I told the disciples to pray? Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. What do you think I was saying there? I said, I think you were saying, Lord, keep me from that temptation. Keep me from the temptation of killing somebody else. Don't lead my children or myself into that that place of evil where they get harmed. Please, Father, in Jesus' name, have mercy. We don't deserve it, but I'm praying. I want My commitment is if they were, they'd have to kill us all. I'd step in front of, them of any bullet that was intended for a loved one. I'd step in front of the bullet, but I'm not going to get send a bullet their way. I'm not. And, and I think that's what Christ is calling us to. Unless we yield all the way, not just some of the whatever is easy, but all of it. We live, take his word and we, we, we swallow it, hook, line, and sinker. That's the only way that we'll, we'll be found to be worthy. Patty? We've had such a long call of religion and ideas, and our emotions get so entangled with all of it. And I think probably everyone in here has a loved one that served in the military service somewhere, somehow. It's just uh, really difficult to separate and divide those things. But if you ask the Lord of the truth, which obviously this group that continues to come week after week, wants to know the truth, then you need to let this come in and shine the light in the dark places that have been uh, walked in for so many years just kind of blindly because it's the only thing we've ever known. We're just doing this from the things that we've known. And I think God is really trying to come and uh, shine the light in our dark places to bring us up to another level. Um, and it takes a lot of courage. The, if you'll remember, Paul was, he was a murderer, wasn't he? He killed. He was, he was in the service of, of the hierarchy of the Jewish nation, and he, he enforced it with a sword. And he felt he did God a great uh, justice when he killed these, these uh, heathen kind of believers. He, uh, he repented of it, and he and he walked a faultless life from there forward, faultless uh, as far as qualifying, because he said at the end that he did finally qualify. So when, when I say, well, I'm speaking to, or if you've been in the service and you've killed and you've done all that's okay. I mean, that's, but where are you at? You know, now, where are you? It's a transition. Where are you now? I'm calling you to accountability today, not, not times past. And, you know, if it, it, not all that, you know, I've, I said, a politician, you wouldn't want to be a politician and be a Christian. You, you couldn't. You couldn't want. You wouldn't want to be a lawyer. You wouldn't want to be a soldier. And these are, these are things that I would be speaking to my children or young ones, my grandkids. These are things that I would be speaking to them. What, what would I be saying? I'd be qualifying it and telling them all, that this is the walk of Christ. If you want to follow in the steps of Christ, here it is. And, and here's, here's the penalty for not, as the way the Word of God says it. The same way that I would steer them away from being effeminate. I'm not sending them to hell here. I'm telling them the price that they're going to pay for their flesh. I'm giving them 
what Christ has set, he's, he set before us all. Are you all tired? No. <laughs> you, can take a, you, can take, you can take a licking and keep on ticking, Jerry. <laughs> I don't remember where I was at. For a Christian... But in the feeling. Okay. Okay. By not rightly dividing the word, many have confused covenants and their respective laws and lay a weight upon the conscience of sin contrary to the Spirit's conviction. You know what I'm saying? You're... When, when you... Ha, uh, when you tell somebody it's a sin to not keep the Sabbath day, you, you have just put on their conscience a burden that's not new covenant. When you, when you tell them it's a new covenant reality to tie 10% of your, of your income or whatever, you, you've just put on them a burden on their conscience that was not orchestrated by the Spirit of God. How many times do we and have we put a, a burden on somebody's heart thinking that it, that it was true reflection of Christianity when in actuality it was a confusion of, of covenants? And then compounding there, we as believers look to obey Moses' law as a means to satisfy a wrongly perceived new covenant justice while asserting the need to repent in Jesus' name. And now observe the laws of Moses to attain forgiveness, approval of God, in order that we might have relief from weight of conscience, implying or blatantly stating we receive grace and peace of the new covenant to fulfill old covenant law. That's a convoluting. That, that's... That's mixing the covenants up. That's, that's, that's putting weights of, uh, on people's conscience that, that's not of the Lord or relieving weights of conscience that are of the Lord that you now have, you have erroneously embraced this message of grace to the degree of cheap grace, licentiousness, and you remove the weight. You add weights when you shouldn't add weight and you remove weights that you should, should leave on because we haven't rightly divided the word of God. And some of us don't want to rightly divide the Word of God. What we want to do is, is divide it rightly for us. I want to rightly divide this Word for me. That's how I'm going to do it. And, and, and it's not going to be, it, what it, it's subliminal. <laughs> you know, the Lord knows our heart, right? The Lord reveals Himself to those that will to do His will. John 7, 17. That's, he knows our hearts, and you, you won't know the will of God because you don't have a will to do the will of God. This wrongly portrays the Old Covenant application to the New Covenant. It confuses the covenants, does away with the exclusive authority of Jesus Christ, and effectively does away with the need of the Lamb of God. Effectively does away with the need of the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. His new covenant appointed sacrifice to meet the disquieting of new covenant revealed sin. This is why we cannot as Christians have two different authorities. To look to the laws of Moses to answer new covenant justice is an attempt to purge the leaven from the conscience with a lamb provided by man. which has no power to purge. It clean the, cleanses the flesh, but it doesn't have any power to purge the conscience or the new man. Paul discloses to us this false approach in mixing covenant law in practical terms. Galatians 5, 6-9, when he says it's neither circumcision or uncircumcision, but faith edified by love, or energized by love. And he, he terms this, this mixing that the Judaizers were trying to get into the new covenant as leaven, 
that would eventually leaven the whole lump, which is what we see today. We've let in a little leaven, just a little bit of leaven in the new covenant in the form of old covenant applications and observances in the new covenant, which has leavened the whole lump. There is no distinctiveness. There is, you, you can't point to, to Christianity because it's not readily or rightly divided. There's no arrogance here, even though it may sound like arrogance. There's no arrogance here at all. The Israelites under the law and prophets were held to a standard of holiness to maintain the just favor of God. If they did, the promised material and earthly blessings were theirs. Health, prosperity, land, victory over their enemies. All of those are old covenant concepts that have been pulled into the new covenant thinking. God bless me. Grant me this, that, and the other. It, it's not a new covenant concept. It's not a Christ-like uh, transition. It's old covenant. We brought it into the church. It's all, it's all received and believed to be true. God wants to, bless. God wants to give you cattle on a thousand hills. God gives wealth to establish his covenant in the earth. Given it shall be given unto you a hundredfold. All we try to bring some kind of old covenant theology that will allow us to, to establish our kingdom on the earth. But the new covenant transition is one to death and sufferings and giving up and losing but gaining. Giving up but gaining peace, grace, Christ-likeness, distinctiveness, worthiness. Who's worthy? It's him that gives up his life. It's him who doesn't grab and look for more and can all he can get. There were shadows. No, I don't even want to get into that subject. Jesus came as prophet, priest, and king, full of the Father's grace and truth, in great contrast to Moses, merely the lawgiver. Jesus manifests to fully reveal God as the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in the fullness of the Godhead, His attributes, and that to the entire population of man. That's a new covenant. That, my friends, is what John in 117 was contrasting. Moses is a lawgiver. Jesus. Now, Jesus is something else, isn't he? We, we, we want to bring and take upon ourselves all the attributes of God. That's what we want. Jesus came, Jesus Christ came as Savior, the only begotten Son of God, in order that He might, through faith in Him, bring many sons unto God. There were, are, other sons of God, a son of God, as angels and Israel are so called, but none before as these. Born of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Not just sons of God, but sons of God full of glory through Jesus Christ. You, you got to see the transition. You got to see the tadpole to the frog to the prince. You got to see that for you, for you to stop mixing the covenants and making a theology that's indistinct. Only the Son coming from the Father manifesting in the flesh of man as one of the persons of the Godhead, which is very God of very God, could possibly prevail and make known the manifest wisdom of God in fullness of grace and truth. That is to say, the only way to supersede the old man in the weakness of his flesh. To replace See, in the Old Covenant, there's no means to supersede the old man. 
All you do is continually atoning for, covering in sin, covering in sin, covering in sin. God got sick of that. But in the new covenant, we have the ability to draw upon all the attributes of God and satisfy his justice and holiness through Christ. And that, for the greater and further purpose, of replacing the old man. Not while, not while we're alive and walking on the earth. It's too much of an intrinsic part of our, our souls, our bodies, our minds. It's too, too much a part of us. And it's too, too much the, it is the process that God has foreordained to qualify those to be worthy, that they must overcome. They must overcome the flesh, not overcome their neighbor, their enemies, overcome the flesh. He turned it internal. By he himself coming in that flesh without sin, withstanding those temptations that caused the first Adam's death, and the second Adam, now unjustly murdered by Satan, thereby condemning sin in the flesh, being then firstborn from the dead, securing and bringing into being a new creation, one that has never been before, the Bible says. This is not a son of God that like, like that son of God or that son of God. This is a son of God like unto Jesus Christ, the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit manifest in. That's a different kind of Son of God. You didn't get that in the Old Covenant, sons of Israel. You didn't get that as a creation, as, as an angel. You only got it through this death, that it's willingness to die to self, that Christ paid the price for in the flesh to make a way for you. That's the only way to attain under this Son of God. And that's what God said He was going to have. Those kinds of sons of God. So distinct. They're just like Christ. <laughs> or they're like Christ. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable the call of God on a man. Now through Christ Jesus. A son of God. Come on now. You might envy somebody's. I wish that was my dad. <laughs> Whoo! Wish that guy was my dad. This is the reality here. Sons of God, can you can't you can't it doesn't get any better than that. In the new creation, those sons of God, Hebrews one, two, and three. It's called a heavenly calling. Hebrews three one, heavenly calling. Jesus calls us up to a heavenly place, a heavenly place above the earth to rule and reign with him. Not into heaven, but into the heavenly places. Okay, I'm going to stop there. That's enough. I think everybody is trying to digest or, or throwing up. <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to stop. I'll leave you to the rest of the lesson. I've Quotes, I, I take some out of Alfred Edersheim's book, uh, Life and Times of the Messiah, and I quoted him several places. And I think I give, yeah, I wrote at the bottom of the last page six, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, book two, chapter five. And the reason I did is because Eders, Edersheim has, is that the correct way to say his name? Eder? Edersheim. Alfred Edersheim. He, in that chapter, in that uh, chapter 2, 5, he explains the, the culture and the, the mindset of the Jew, the religious Jew, when Christ manifested himself after the baptism of John. He, he gives that, the, that description that will greatly uh, embellish your thinking um, as it relates to the resistance and why. For instance, for instance, uh, Edersheim says 
that uh, the Jewish concept of the first sin uh, by Adam was not a result necessarily of an outward um, influence. Uh, because in a Jewish mind, every man, including Adam, was born with an inclination to evil and an inclination to good, to which they believe Adam gave in and he gave in to the inclination of evil, and thereby he sinned. So that's a directly opposed to the new covenant teaching of how a man is dead spiritually, physically, and, and uh, uh, soulishly, and how he's in a state of death. And I, in the lesson, I explained this out. And, but what I'm trying to say is, in that culture, in that time, there, was a, there wasn't the same kind of concept as the need for a savior from sin. See? <laughs> it, it, they didn't have the same concept or, except or the idea of a suffering, uh, a suffering offering or servant of, Christ, of God that would come and die for the sins. They didn't have, because they didn't see that, that they, they saw every man was born with it. And, it, and in a way, they defer, or deterred or detracted or deferred to God the, the cause of sin. You see? It's really God. It's really, at the, when you boil it down, it's God's fault because he created this with an inclination to do evil. But God, God doesn't own that. Okay? And, and he puts the, 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 the real onus to the, at the feet of Satan and at man, because he was created good and very good. So just it, it helps, though, to see now, oh, I, I see why they would reject a suffering Messiah. Because in their minds, they were looking for a Messiah that would raise them back up to that preeminent nation uh, victoriously with a strong arm over all the Gentiles. And this ain't him. This mealy mouth, whatever, he's going to, What? So there was a pushback for John. There was a pushback, John the Baptist. There was a pushback for Christ. And, and in this, I try to lay some, some understanding that you can project from the law and its application and to what Christ fulfilled and done what he did to move us into this transition. You can see it. Kind of, if you had what I've I just been speaking to you about the last hour and a half, and you read that, it, what Alfred writes, I think it's augmented. But in the name of the Lord, I pray for, for uh, I pray for this group. I pray that, um, I pray that uh, the Spirit of the Lord have His way, His voice, His will, and uh, work with us through these uh, really difficult kinds of uh, transitions. Uh, we're pretty well embedded with a lot of religious thinkings. I keep thinking I'm getting rid of, I've gotten rid of my religious thing. You know? All of a sudden, here's another wave, another wave. I never would have guessed that the wave would take the form that it's been taking. But it's, I think it's the wave, the light, the wave that needs to be because we're moving in, and we're not moving into, we're in. We're in the times, the difficult times when things are evil or called good and good. It's hard to see. And the only thing that's going to keep us is light. And, and it's got to be spoken. It can't be hid. It has to be spoken. It has to be lifted up. And it, this... This will, even though it sounds tough and hard, it's where the glory is. If you submit to Christ, it's where the glory is. And when we, it's hard to submit, and that's what I'm feeling. I'm feeling hard, hard, hard to submit because that's the way I feel. I mean, it's not any easier for me, is it? So I feel that, and, but I know where the glory is. I know where the peace is. I know where the grace is, and uh, that's what I anticipate for this group 
to be able to draw upon. In order to conform to the image of Christ, we have to renew our mind and that's what you have on the Amen. Renew our mind to the Word. Right? 